Good morning. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, Jamie is uh, responsible for having me here, so if you don't like my talk, go hassle with him. Uh, so thank you, Jamie, and thank you, Michael Feldman, wherever you are, having donuts someplace. I'm delighted to be here. I, I, well, I say that whenever I speak, but I'm delighted to be here. Uh, if you want a copy of these slides, uh, just go to my website, and uh, how handy is that? Just uh, slides slash nexus, and you can have your own copy of the slides. Now, um, uh, just the other day, Governor Mike Pence of Indiana, he kind of gave my talk. So, uh, <laughs> any questions? <laughs> now, um, this, is, this is the narrative that uh, we're supposed to be uh, thinking about. Uh, it's uh, like the church versus uh, the gay gentleman over there. Uh, but I'm here to tell you that um, every one of us, our picture should be in there, because this is not about gay people, this is about people, and it's not about marriage, and it's not about equality, it's about everybody's rights about uh, uh, under the democratic system. So the, um, the, the Religious Freedom Act, the, the restoration of, uh, of Religious Freedom Act, is a, is a power grab. It's a, it's a predictable use of power by the religious right, and I want to tell you uh, about that. And the, the war on sex, which I've been talking about and writing about for a few years, uh, it's, in my, uh, it's in my book, America's War on Sex, and it matters because the religious right is using the issue of sexual regulation in particular to do two things, to undermine secular democracy and to delegitimize science as a factor in public policy. And that's why we need to care about uh, what the religious right is doing in America's war on sex and why we need to care about what they're doing about sexuality. Now, if you want to get people to think less, all you have to do is throw the word sex into a room. When I'm on an airplane and people ask me what I do and I don't want to talk to anybody, I just tell them I sell insurance. And then nobody, and then I say, would you like to hear about our newest policy? And then people, you know, they, they don't want to talk to me. But, you know, if I want attention, all I have to do is tell people I'm a sex therapist and then, you know, I, I have friends for life. That's what organized religion does. They see sex everywhere they look, and they can't stop talking about it. Here's, here's just some of the ways in which religion sees sex everywhere. They see people, they see families on a nude beach. You know what a nude beach is called in Italy? A beach. So they see families on a nude beach, they see sex. They see uh, young people getting information about their bodies in school sex education, they see sex. They see uh, research that generates understanding of how people mate and court and reproduce, and they see sex. They see, uh, uh, they see people talking about uh, the rehabilitation of certain criminals, they see sex. They see sex everywhere they look. They are obsessed with it. And they say that they're the morality experts. They say sex is about morality, they're the morality experts. Sex is not about science, it's not about economics, it's not about data, sex is about morality, and they're the morality experts. And they say, uh, since they're the morality experts and sex is about morality, they are the ones uh, who should be called upon to regulate it. They, should, uh, they think they're the ones who should be regulating sexuality. And that means limiting choices. And so predictably, when organized religion gets political power, their mission is to limit people's choices. It's not an accident, it's not a sideshow, that's the mission. And so it's a power grab by one of the many constituencies in America to limit the choices of other constituencies. And that's why we should care about this. Their mission is to delegitimize science and to narrow people's choices. And here's an example of what happens. Uh, you know, this guy says, I've been in the doghouse ever since I tried to get my mother-in-law hanged as a witch. What happens when religious people get political power? So this, this, this law, this law, which started out as a federal law and now it's rolling out all over the country, it exempts people and organizations, since organizations are now people. You know, that's, that's what corporations and fetuses have in common. They're both people. Um, so, so RIFRA um, exempts people and organizations from laws. Now, in case you think it's just happening in Indiana, it's not. This is a map of where, um, of where these laws are happening all over the country. 
So more than half of the states have some version of this or want to have some version of this. Let's, let's do a quick lesson on the First Amendment. You may have heard of this, the First Amendment. Great idea. I think we should try it sometime. So uh, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. So you can't say that uh, in order to run for office, you have to be a certain uh, religion. Of course, try and say, I'm an atheist, I'm running for president. But uh, the idea is that the government is not allowed to say you have to belong to a certain religion. You can't establish a religion. And the First Amendment says that the government can't prohibit the free exercise of religion. Nice and vague. And what's happening is that some people are confusing freedom to worship with the right to practice, uh, to, w w with the right to have government support of a religious lifestyle. And that's where we're running into trouble. Everybody has the right to worship. The question about the government supporting a religious lifestyle is where we're getting into a lot of trouble. So maybe you know the word exceptionalism. I talk about the exceptionalism of religion. Religion uh, feels, uh, organized religion, feels that it's uh, different than every other enterprise, and so it gets certain rights, and that it is based, of course, on personal, subjective, non-rational belief. And they're obsessed with sexuality, particularly about boundary violations, and particularly around uh, deciding what's normal and what's not normal. So when organized religion gets political power and they pass laws uh, preventing certain groups uh, from doing certain things, it's not because of data, quite the contrary. It's because they have this idea of what's wrong for people to do. And it's interesting that organized religion has a seat at the public policy table, and they aren't uh, required to provide any data to support their position. So, for example, you may know about the drug Gardasil, which if you give to uh, uh, kids before they become sexually active, will protect them from HPV. The religious right went after the distribution of that drug, saying that it would lead to promiscuity. No data, and no data required, because they're the morality experts, they get to talk about this and say, well, that's just our belief. And in fact, the data is actually available, and it's in Europe, and it's to the contrary, which is that uh, kids who uh, have been protected with this drug, they're not more sexually active than other kids. So here are a whole bunch of, of ways in which organized religion is driving public policy, not only without data to support it, but in most cases, despite, despite what the data actually says, if only they were required to, um, to conform to it. So uh, school sex, sex education does not make kids go out and have sex. Believe it or not, kids think about sex before they go to school and after school. It's not like they're not thinking about sex and they go to school and say, oh, gee, sex education, what a great idea. Um, <laughs> condom distribution in schools does not lead to more sex. Um, the state of Arizona is a leader in criminalizing private strip clubs and swing clubs. They had a perfectly nice uh, swing scene in Arizona, which they completely dismantled. They didn't even have to have public hearings because they um, uh, said that it was an emergency. It was a public health emergency, so they could pass an emergency law dismantling all the swing clubs. Didn't have to have any, um, didn't have to have any hearings. Um, and sex research has been radically defunded in the United States because after all, everybody knows about sex, so why do we need research? And you all know about the rights of sexual minorities and where that's going. And sexuality is religion's worst nightmare. It's the, it's the worst nightmare of totalitarian regimes and organized religion. That's an interesting combination, isn't it? It's the, sexuality is the worst nightmare of these people because it's the place where people can experience maximum personal autonomy. And that's not what organized religion or totalitarian regimes are, uh, are about. Now, uh, the, the folks behind organized religion are not stupid. So now that the immorality thing is losing a bit of its punch, they've, they're evolving their narrative into a public health danger narrative. So instead of saying that pornography is immoral, they're saying it's dangerous. Instead of saying that um, it's immoral to have certain shows on TV, they're saying it's bad for children or it's bad for grown-ups. 
Um, instead of saying that it's immoral for couples to swing, they're saying that swinging spreads disease. Actually, if you look in the swingers community, they have a lower rate of sexually transmitted infection than the rest of the population. Strip clubs, same thing. Strip clubs, the, the, it used to be you shouldn't go and watch a stripper because it's immoral. Now what organized religion is saying is you shouldn't go to a strip club uh, because strip, uh, strip clubs attract crime. And it turns out that if you compare what goes on around strip clubs and what goes on around college football games, let's say, uh, there's no comparison. A lot more crime with college football games. So, so these, things, these things sound scientific. You know, when, when organized religion says, oh, uh, you shouldn't uh, have uh, strip clubs in your community because they attract crime. That sounds very scientific, but, but it's not scientific. And in fact, it, um, it's, it's an anti-science position because they keep coming back to, well, uh, I don't need the data. I know how I feel. And if it's sex, how I feel is good enough. So once again, they're excluding science from public policy. And what they're doing is they've got this sexual disaster thing going, which is persuading people that there's a lot more sexual violence out there than there actually is, that the world is a lot more dangerous around sexuality than it actually is, generating a lot of fear. And they use, they use rhetorical tricks like, well, you know, maybe you don't care if your kids are safe, but I care if my kids are safe. When was the last time you walked up to somebody who said, kids safe? I don't care if my kids are safe or not. I'm just too goddamn selfish for that. You, generally, people don't say that. And I've been a therapist a long time. Generally, people don't say that. So the sexual disaster industry is uh, overstating the level of sexual violence and overstating uh, how dangerous it is out there and creating the illusion that there's an, a dangerous other out there. You know, there's like the porn monster, is gonna steal your marriage, and sex education monster, is gonna steal your daughter. In my book, I talk about the battlegrounds in the war on sex, and that's uh, sex education and the internet, and you know, my website, which is not a porn website, by the way, uh, But I hear there are plenty of those. <laughs> my website, the, the URL, the URL is sexed.org. My website is blocked in, in many um, state universities and state libraries in the country simply because of the URL. And uh, that's just not right. That's just not right. So the internet is a big focus, of course, of the war on sex. Um, they're, they're driving laws in the criminal justice system. Uh, they're going after reproductive rights, of course, and their goal, their goal is to restrict whatever makes sex more normal, whatever makes sex safer, whatever makes sex more fun, whatever makes sex healthier, whatever makes sex more understandable, whatever makes sex more comfortable. That's what the war on sex is going after. They don't want the normal rules of conventional society to apply to sex, conventional rules like communication and responsibility and honesty and science and all of that. No, no, no. They would much rather sex because it's special to be subject to special rules like God's plan and tradition. So their idea is let's have a moral panic. Now, if you ask the organized religion what the problems in American culture are, they'll talk about the porn problem and the promiscuity problem. You know, promiscuous, that's a person who has sex one more time than you do. And, <laughs> the, and you know who you are. If you, if you ask, if you ask uh, organized religion about the problems in America, these are the, these are the narratives that, that we have a gay problem, that we have a immorality problem, that we have an abortion problem. And you all know, because you're oriented to science and rational problem solving, you know that the very first step in solving a problem is how you formulate the problem. So if these are the problems that we agree on that we have in American culture, that's what's gonna drive the solutions. Like, what do we do about our gay problem? What do we do about our porn problem? But imagine if we, conceptualize the problems in America in a different way. Not that we had a gay problem, but that we had an intolerance problem. Not that we had a, um, a porn problem, but that we had a censorship problem. 
That'd be a lot different. That'd be a lot different. So, so my work and the work of everyone who's interested in science-based public policy is trying not just to uh, resolve some of the problems that are current in the country, but trying to uh, help formulate the narrative about what the problem is so that the pool of solutions is going to be coming from a rational basis. The religious right uses phony categories. Now, this is something that you can do at home. You don't need me there with you. This is something you can do at home. When you read uh, the newspaper, I know you all read the paper, when you look at your uh, device and you see the day's news, when you uh, are listening to BBC World Service, Channel 167, whatever it is, when you are exposed to media narratives, watch out for these phony categories. Here's a phony category. Don't you think we ought to do something about those people who are either keeping library books overdue or murdering people? Don't you think we ought to do something about those people? Yeah, we got to do something about those people. So that's a phony category. People who keep library books overdue and people who murder, that's a phony category. When it comes to sexuality, the, the organized religion and America's war on sex, they are filling cultural narratives with phony categories like porn and child porn. That's a phony category. Those are two completely separate things like S&M and violence. Those are two separate things. The DSM-4, uh, you know, used to talk about victims of uh, of sexual, uh, of, of sadomasochism, you know, uh, legitimate sadomasochism, there are no victims, you know, that's like victims of the foxtrot, I mean, there are no victims, it's, <laughs> glad you remember the foxtrot. Another phony category, molestation and childhood sexuality, those are two separate things. When people talk about, you know, uh, what's wrong with Facebook is that young people are getting invitations for sex from friends and strangers. That's a phony category from friends and strangers. From friends and strangers. Victims of trafficking and prostitution. I've been writing about this new craze now about sex trafficking. People who are really interested in sex trafficking, they are expanding that category as we speak. As we speak, they're uh, expanding that category now to include all prostitution and all um, adult films, all pornography. Saying that all of the participants in Pornography and prostitution are victims of trafficking. And so overnight now, we have 80 trillion uh, people in the US who are supposedly been trafficked. Um, so here are just a couple of examples of how this works in real life. Uh, this is the age of first marriage. For the last 150 years, it's been going up, 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 up. And most of you are contributing to that increase. Thank you. Age of first marriage going up. Onset of puberty going down. So 150 years ago, the onset of puberty and the age of first marriage, practically the same. You know, the, the amount of time you had for premarital sex was about a week and a half. <laughs> and, and now, the onset of puberty for a lot of people is 10 or 11. When our bodies start to mature sexually, 10 or 11. Age of first marriage in the United States, now 25 and a half. That's a big area for, you should pardon the expression, premarital sex or non-marital sex. What are these young people supposed to do? Not have sex from the time they're 10 and a half till the time that they're 25. Family Research Council says, you know, if we give this vaccine to young people, they may think, oh, I'm safe, now I can have sex. Yeah, I hear a lot of 13-year-old 13 13 girls say, you know, Kevin, I'd love to have sex, but I might get HPV and die when I'm 45, so I think I'm going to say no. We already talked about sex trafficking. Here's um, the cover of Newsweek a couple of years ago, the John Next Door. It's all about the horrifying problem with sex trafficking. And then you read the article, and it's about, yeah, there's prostitution in the United States. Uh -huh, I've heard of that. And that, um, according to Newsweek, it's warping people's relationships. No data whatsoever about that. Just scaring the hell out of people. Uh, sex education, the same thing. You may have heard of Laura Bush. I don't know if you're old enough to remember Laura Bush. Um, this whole idea that abstinence is 100% uh, effective. Let's look at people who actually use abstinence. Here are uh, undergraduates. This is from American Journal of Health Education. 500 undergraduates at uh, your basic. They, didn't, they couldn't get Harvard, so they got Northern Kentucky U. Um, two thirds of the people broke their pledge to be celibate before marriage. This is the Journal of Public Health. 14,000 young people, half of the students 
half of the students who broke their virginity pledges, remember two thirds of people break their virginity pledges, half of them broke their virginity pledges and then denied that they had made that pledge. And, and what I love here is that a third of the people who pledged virginity until marriage, they had sex and they said they were virgins. I love that. Uh, Journal of Adolescent Health, national study of 20,000 young people, 12% of young people who took virginity pledges kept their promise. So people like Laura Bush say, well, they're, they're not using abstinence. Yes, they are using abstinence. This is how abstinence works. You promise to be abstinent and then you're not. That's how abstinence works. That's the science of it. You get 100,000 people who pledge abstinence. This is how abstinence works. Five years later, 88% of them have been sexual. So that's how abstinence works. And that's why abstinence is not such a good policy. Is pornography dangerous? If you were around on New Year's Eve before the year 2000, we might have been sitting around saying, I wonder what would happen if we flooded the United States, if we flooded this great country of ours with free, high quality pornography. I wonder what would happen. Oops, it happened. We have a naturally occurring experiment. It's amazing. In 2000, broadband came to all the homes in America, and that means that free, High quality pornography came to everybody's house overnight, almost overnight. And what would we predict would happen? Well, geez, if everybody had like really high quality free pornography, uh, we'd all go on a diet and lose weight to look like them, right? Or uh, gee, if uh, we had free uh, pornography in everybody's house, everybody would get divorced. I mean, who needs marriage and all those hassles when you've got free high quality pornography? I have a lot of patients who wonder about that. So what would happen? What would happen? Well, we did the experiment. We've now had 15 years of the experiment. If you flood the United States with free, high-quality pornography, what happens? What happens? The rate of sexual assault goes down. The rate of divorce goes down. The rate of suicide goes down. The rate of teen pregnancy goes down. The rate of child sexual exploitation goes down. I'm too much of a social scientist to say cause and effect. I just noticed what two things happened at the same time. And by the way, for those of you who are keeping score at home, and even if you're not, the same exact data holds for Japan, Denmark, Croatia, Cyprus. The introduction of pornography on a mass level has been accompanied by a reduction in sexual violence in that country. Very interesting numbers. We don't have to do cause and effect, although we could do that if you want to have a drink later. But but anyone who says that porn is causing rape, these numbers say no, it's not. Anyone who says that, that porn is causing child molestation, these numbers say no, it's not. Social, as, as the level of porn goes up, the level of social pathology has gone down, but the level of sexual anxiety has gone up. And that's because somebody is driving that sexual anxiety. And those are people who are not interested in the scientific numbers. Those are people who are interested in an entirely different thing. And by the way, people who complain that pornography is bad sex education. <laughs> if you don't like the sex education that young people are getting from pornography, support high quality comprehensive sex education in school and at home. And by the way, if you're bitching about the lessons that young people are getting about sex from pornography, let's also talk about the lessons that young people are getting about sex when they go to church or some of the other institutions that they're involved with. So how do we respond to this? I'll tell you, the religious right is the main political force in America that takes emotion seriously. And we're not doing a very good job of addressing what people care about. We talk about data, people's eyes kind of glaze over, right? And if we're not talking about emotion, then the religious right takes over that arena of public policy, and they're the ones who talk about emotion. What do people care about? I can, I've been a, a marriage counselor for 34 years. I can tell you what people care about. They care about danger. They care about their kids getting hurt. They care about their husband or their wife having an affair. They care about whether or not they can get an erection. They care about... Uh, whether or not their fantasies are kinky. That's what people care about. 
So we need to talk about that stuff. We need to say things like, well, of course, we all want our children to be safe. We need to say things like, well, fortunately, when we're nervous and we want to do the right thing, but we don't know what to do, we could turn to science and actually get some answers. We need to say, you know, I'd like to answer that question, but it's based on so many assumptions that I'm afraid I can't agree with. Let's actually answer a different question. You know, an elephant is a very interesting animal, but rather than talk about elephants, giraffes, now there's an interesting animal. So let's not necessarily answer the questions that people are uh, putting to us if we don't like the assumptions that are baked into the questions. And let's remind people that we speak with that mostly we care about the same stuff, although we may differ on our ideas about how to create that stuff. And that can be uh, a little bit helpful in uh, balancing people's interests and emotions and balancing uh, our desire to talk about facts. Um, and, and this shows why communication is so important. No, no, I said I've got acute angina. So let's remember communication, very important. For more information about the war on sex or sexual intelligence, of course, you can pick up one of my books um, uh, uh, where they're being sold. Uh, I, thank, I, I appreciate your attention very much. And again, I want to thank Jamie and Michael for having me. You've been uh, very nice to me. Thank you.